Let me read to you a passage from the 20th chapter of St. John's Gospel, verses 19 to 23. It's the Gospel for Pentecost Sunday, Mass during the day. St. John writes, On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. That's from John chapter 20, verses 19 to 23. It speaks of the gift of the Spirit of God. On Pentecost Sunday, we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit to the infant church, and through the church to each of the church's members. When we set St. Luke's account of Pentecost in the Acts of the Apostles against the whole sweep of Scripture, it is plain that the event involved an altogether special coming of God the Holy Spirit to his people. God came to Moses in the burning bush. He came to his people when he took them through the Red Sea from the pursuing Egyptians. He came to his people on Mount Sinai and gave them the covenant. He came to David when, having been anointed by Samuel, the Spirit of the Lord fell upon him. First book of Samuel, chapter 16, verse 13. He came to his people when speaking through various of his prophets. Pentecost was a special culmination of these comings of God to his people. In the infant church gathered in the upper room of Jerusalem. Thirty-three years earlier, there had been the coming of God to his people when the Word was made flesh, an event momentous, though unnoticed except for a few specially chosen, such as the shepherds and the magi. Now at Pentecost, there was this further coming, this divine coming, not of God the Son, but of the third divine person, God the Holy Spirit. Just as the prophets had foretold the coming of the Messiah, so the Messiah promised the coming of the Holy Spirit, a promise prefigured in various of the prophecies, such as in Joel chapter 3, verse 1. At the Last Supper, Christ called him the Advocate, the other defender, the Spirit of Truth. When the Advocate comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who issues from the Father, he will be my witness. Our Lord had taught them about himself, about the Father, and about the saving plan of God. But they needed life and light and power from God if the word of Christ was to be grasped and to have its effect in them. I still have many things to say to you, but they would be too much for you now. But when the Spirit of Truth comes, he will lead you to the complete truth since he will not be speaking as from himself, but will say only what he has learnt, since all he tells you will be taken from what is mine. John chapter 16, verse 12 to 15. So important was this coming of the Holy Spirit that our Lord told his disciples that unless he returned to the Father, the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, would not come to them. He was saying, in effect, that it was critically important that the Spirit of Truth come. Or, despite all he had done and suffered, little would be achieved. If, there's, if there was to be any life in what he had planted in his disciples and in the foundation of the kingdom that he had laid, the Holy Spirit must come and act. What came to the church with the coming of the Holy Spirit was life. At Pentecost, the church was born to a new life. It saw the light of day and began to grow in strength. With this life came light, the light of God, involving conviction and understanding, filled the hearts of the apostles and the church's members, and they immediately began to do what Christ had said to Pilate was his mission, 
to bear witness to the truth, the truth being the truth of Christ. The coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost shows to every generation that the Spirit of God, who is the Lord and giver of life, brings life and light to the church and to the church's members. At the beginning of his gospel, chapter 1, verse 4 to 5, St. John says that whatever came to be in the word found life, life for the light of men. That life and that light which was to be found in the word made flesh was the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Jesus came to give him to us. Long before the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 37 saw a vision of the valley full of bones, a vision of death. Then suddenly breath entered the bones and they began to be covered with skin and flesh and sinews and they stood up an immense army. They had come to life through the power of God's Spirit. It is sin that brings death and the taking away of sin means life. The most immediate and life-giving effect of the coming of the Holy Spirit is the forgiveness of sin. At our Lord's meeting with his disciples on the day of his resurrection, he breathed on them and gave them a share in his Holy Spirit, and with that he endowed them with the power to forgive sins. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. John chapter 20 verse 19 to 23. Let us learn to recognize the action of the Spirit of God in our life so as to be able to cooperate with Him. Too often we scarcely advert to His presence within us. He is a neglected guest. Let us ever remember that He abides within us. He is there as our friend, our teacher, counselor, guide, defender, and above all, our sanctifier. Remembering Him, let us cultivate a love for Him, for He is our God. Let us be alert to His promptings. He will enlighten us about Jesus, inspire us to follow Him generously, and give us the strength to do, to do so more and more heroically. Let us not make Him sad by deliberate sin, and let us pray to Him daily. Come, come, O Holy Spirit.